you. Josh works for the DNR and um, he works with the Dry Run Creek Watershed Project. And um, this project has quite a bit of grant opportunities for people that want to implement some water conservation or uh, water pest management practices in the landscape. Today, I just wanna mostly encourage you to offer your new homeowners um, an option to have a friendly landscape, just how you do options for your living rooms or for the number of rooms in the house. Just my, my idea would be if you could give an option and put it in your websites <coughs> of uh, water friendly landscapes. So um, with that, Josh, I just want you to go and if you want, just explain what options are there. Uh, it seems like Craig is trying to connect, but it'll be pretty good. And just, it, it's pretty informal conversation. Josh will talk for a few minutes. Feel free to ask at any time. I would just want mostly to have a conversation. And then if there are any questions at the end, that would be great too. But feel free to interrupt. So Josh, go ahead. <laughs> All right, Marie, you're gonna have to give me uh, the option to screen share. You should be able now, can you? Okay, yep, sure can, thank you. All right, is that coming through? Okay. So yep, so just gonna talk about some of this uh, green infrastructure opportunities and the financial incentives that are out there. Uh, but first off, I'll wish you a happy early Earth Month here in a couple of days. Uh, we'll be kicking off uh, Earth Month, you know, and we have Earth Day and all those wonderful celebrations, Stone Water Conservation Weekend there as well. But we'll go ahead and get down to business talking about finances, so. Traditional stormwater infrastructure, you know, a lot of times that's just water running off hard surfaces, going through pipes, ending up in our streams and rivers and lakes, sometimes being filtered with a detention basin. But what we're really trying to encourage here is green infrastructure, encouraging water to, to get into the ground um, so that way it can be filtered, reduce pollutants, all that kind of wonderful stuff. And there's many ways to incorporate these into uh, new developments, existing developments, and, and have those, those benefits there. So I guess, you know, think of traditional management as yeah, detention basins, underground storage, but what we're missing there is water quality benefits. And that's why low impact development and a lot of these conservation practices, you know, these are designed to manage water, um, and because of that, you know, with that water treatment, that's where there are these financial incentives out there. Um, but it also has benefits of increasing value, marketability, and, and um, saving financial um, in the long run rather than having to retrofit. So although it's very easy for me to incorporate conservation in my little stormwater model home, it can be also easy with a little bit of planning to get these incorporated into real homes. So things like permeable pavements, rain gardens are really great opportunities. We're looking at the back of a model home, you know, ensuring that there's sufficient compost and topsoil can really help out with um, developments. Incorporated native prairie landscaping, rainwater harvesting are all things that, that homeowners reach out to, to me about. Um, requesting information on. And then for, for larger areas, um, you know, there's ways to manage the stormwater runoff um, down off-site, um, things like bioinfiltration with biocells or bioswales, large native prairie establishments, and stormwater wetlands are all great opportunities to manage large areas of stormwater. So native landscaping, um, you know, we really encourage this adoption because with the deep root structure, we're really helping absorb a lot more water, um, but we're getting the added benefits of helping out habitat. Um, I think especially with the, the plight of bees and butterflies, we have many, many homeowners reaching out to our office requesting information on you know, just how they can put some, some milk um, or some, you know, some beneficial plants in the ground that's going to help out our pollinators. And it doesn't have to be entire yards. It can be individual plants, nice landscaping accents, 
uh, done on a small scale, but uh, throughout an entire community, they can have really large uh, benefits there. Rain gardens are really great options to manage um, runoff from homes. Um, you know, incorporating a few downspouts, directing that water to this landscape depression uh, helps it be absorbed into the ground. And these can be really attractive landscape features. And you know, we we've worked with probably a, a few dozen homeowners that have wanted rain gardens installed on their property and work with landscapers or the homeowners themselves. So these are really simple conservation practices uh, that, like I said, can manage runoff from an entire home. Um, if we have if we're working with multiple homes or a large drainage area, you know, over a few thousand square feet of hard surface, that's when we might look at something like a bioretention cell or a bioswale. So these conservation practices are a little bit more engineered, um, but we can manage up to four acres of runoff um, with a biocell. And you know, they're about 4% of the drainage area is kind of what's required for them. So a little bit of site, uh, site being set aside for this, uh, like I said, can do a really great way of managing runoff. Another common conservation practice, permeable pavement. Um, so these have large rock chambers underneath that can help temporarily store water when it runs off. You know, it works its way through the pavers, through the little cracks in between them. But uh, we've installed these in driveways. Um, some homeowners have done it as patio areas um, on, on their own. Um, we've also worked with uh, entire parking lots, or sidewalks. Um, so there's, you know, any place that there's a hard surface, there's an opportunity for permeable pavement to be incorporated. We also have a handful of green roofs here in the Cedar Valley. Maybe not as common, um, but still an opportunity. Uh, there's a large roof area. Um, you know, these are great green sponges um, that, that can do a, a great job of filtering out a lot of the pollutants that normally be with uh, stormwater runoff. And then when we're dealing with really large areas, um, we can look at wetlands as an option. So these are alternatives rather than just a tension basin. You know, these can handle hundreds of acres of, of runoff um, from large development areas. And so we do have a handful of these scattered throughout our community. And in comparison to just a detention basin, you know, these incorporate native prairie plants. These are adding habitat and creating an ecosystem. Uh, so birders benefit, the pollinators benefit. Um, and I would say, you know, these are attractive features that, have, that we can incorporate trails and lots of great features in here. Um, so really, uh, like I said, a larger ecosystem rather than just detention and dealing with it that way. So my role in all this and what I do, you know, I get to play in the water, I get to play in the mud a little bit, um, but really um, I, I manage a lot of the paper. I try and help make landowners, developers, businesses, residents that are interested in these type of conservation practices. I try and handle all the stuff to make these happen. So whether that's applying for grants, looking for funds, sending paperwork off and submitting it, uh, that's really what I try and do to make it as easy as possible. So, and the reason, the emphasis for this is, you know, here in our state, we have many streams and lakes that aren't meeting the water quality standards set by the DNR. You know, we have several hundred um, lakes and streams that, that are impacted and designated as impaired. And so each one of these dots on this map represent a targeted water quality project. So some of these are staffed with people like myself trying to encourage conservation, getting grant funds to get this conservation on the ground. And here in the Cedar Valley, we have the Dry Run Creek watershed. So you can kind of see on this map runs from about 12th Street on the north end down a little pit bit past Highway 20 and from about Cedar Heights out to about Hearst. Um, so that's kind of about the ge general geographic area, but any landowners, businesses, residents that are interested in conservation in this area uh, can receive additional assistance. And that comes in the form of financial cost share up to 75% through Dry Run Creek. For any landowners that are interested in conservation outside of the Dry Run Creek watershed, there's other uh, financial incentives 
the REIT program to provide 50% cost share for conservation. And then there's also low interest loans through the state revolving fund program to help make, uh, help spread out um, the, the cost of conservation. So it's not so much right up front. There's a handful of additional grants um, that we've utilized in the past. The Iowa Department of Agriculture offers one annually, the WQI Urban Conservation. So that can provide some significant uh, financial incentives. And we at the Soil and Water Conservation District can apply on behalf of, of private landowners to get conservation. Um, so like I said, that's what we do. You know, we look at these uh, grant opportunities. If we can pull enough resources together, we can go after state and federal grant funds, manage the paperwork and get this conservation on the ground. We also work with a lot of local partners um, here in the Cedar Valley and statewide agencies to pull in additional resources, funds, and get this conservation on the ground. So I'm not gonna go through this. Uh, this is pretty much the, the full step process uh, to get conservation, um, but really, I guess just the main highlights, you know, our office offers free, no obligation um, recommendations. You know, we can review site plans, go out and visit in the field, talk about the conservation opportunities and identify what financial incentives might be out there. Then the paperwork side of things, we try and keep it as simple as possible. An application, simple one page form that's submitted to one of our monthly meetings. We can secure the funds for you. After that, construction can go through with a little bit of paperwork um, just for, for site review. Then when all the work's done, we send the paperwork off to the funding agency and then the applicant gets a reimbursement check uh, usually in three to four weeks. So like I said, you know, it's try and keep it as simple and easy as possible. You know, when we're going for additional grants, um, you know, it might require an additional step of uh, a letter of support, but really a lot of grants run the same way as well. You know, conservation's implemented and then um, a reimbursement check is submitted on the back end there. If you're looking for information about any of these conservation practices I talked about, I definitely encourage you to check out iowastormwater.org, the Iowa Stormwater Education Partnership. They have great resources on there, including these very simple brochures um, that highlight each one of these conservation practices. If you really wanna get in the weeds, you can look at the Iowa Stormwater Manual um, and as uh, they get lined up on uh, the iowastormwater.org for more um, design detail that goes pretty in depth there. Also encourage if this is something you're interested, thinking about a, a, a development, um, you know, that there's great resources on the EPA website about doing cost benefit analysis for conservation. So I definitely encourage that if you're wondering about the economics and how it could actually work out, um, there's great resources there. You know, I'm trying to sum everything up here. You know, why even consider conservation? It's because the alternative is, is the, the status quo, which has our water quality uh, degraded here in our community. So we have opportunities with this conservation to help out our community, help water quality. These can also be done in a very attractive way that homeowners can be very supportive of. Um, you know, they're requesting it. Um, so this is, this is, like I say, an attractive landscape feature that not only benefits humans, but also our pollinators habitat here in the community. And it's a great way to be a good neighbor. Um, and then it's also preventing homeowners from dealing with waterfront property that they did not intentionally purchase. Um, that's when I usually get calls when people have a lake in their backyard. So doing this conservation uh, can help prevent that. And I was like, talking about the aquatics, you know, our aquatic creatures benefit from in this conservation, us humans benefit from outdoor recreation, and even here in the state of Iowa, outdoor recreation does have a large dollar value. And I would say that consumers are demanding this type of conservation work. You know, they, they are supportive, they're willing to pay extra dollars uh, to support green infrastructure, low impact development. Um, and you know, it's, it's all across the age groups, new homeowners that are looking at this stuff. And like I said, they're willing to pay more to, to have a sign that says, you know, this is a green home, this is sustainable, this is helping our community as a whole. 
And so, like I said, my goal is to be a resource for anyone who's interested in this. You can contact me anytime, talk about potential projects, past projects, anything, and I'll try and be a resource to assist and help facilitate anything of interest.